somebody who's a researcher will put information out there that's well documented, well researched, and then some blogger will put something out that is based on very little information and both seems to have equal weight. So the onus now, because there's so much information out there. This is the Gold Medal Mindset, where we bring you all things winning in business, sport, and life. I'm Dr. Jason Richardson, pro BMX world champion and Pan Am Games gold medalist. Now I'm a professional speaker, author, and winning mindset coach. Thanks for joining in. Get ready to mind for gold as we challenge your perception to change your results. Back on the Gold Medal Mindset, thank you so much for listening to my monologues these past couple of weeks, but there's been a lot going on and a lot on my mind, so I appreciate it. This week, we have another psychologist, so I don't know how deep we're going to go, and you know we go deep, but either way, she's been featured on CNN, Fox News. She was a journalist. Now she is a fellow psychologist. She is a clinical psychologist as well. She sees patients in New York. She is a Psy D, P-S-Y capital D, just like me, or maybe just like I'm just like her. And uh, we had a fun conversation about that. Uh, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, how you doing? Thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I know it's so exciting to connect with fellow therapists who are also in the media. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends, my dear friends, are psychologists who do TV. So it's so funny. A lot of people outside of our business will say, well, isn't that competition? How can you be friends with people who are doing the same thing you're doing? And I respond in the most honest way I can is that really there's room for everybody and we have a lot in common. So it's kind of nice to speak with people who are really authentic and passionate about what they do. And I find those are the kinds of people I'm drawn to. Nice, nice. I, I, well, we can start right there with what you said, because I thought that was amazing. So my, as I don't know if you even know, but my background is sports and I have an MBA, blah, blah, blah. My, my listeners know this. They've heard it way too many times. But um competition is awesome. So, you know, if I'm taking kind of the gold medal mindset ethos mm -hmm. and applying it to this conversation, I noticed this as well, especially within the business of psychology. And I'll say the business mm -hmm. of psychology from, from a, you know, having an office, have, you know, s sitting across from someone doing therapy or counseling. I've noticed too, that, um, there, there's a, it's a, understated competition as if there's a limited pie. What are your thoughts right. on that? <laughs> well, I think that there is a reality out there that there probably is in some regard, a limited amount of spots for certain fields, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I think right. that's just a, a reality out there, but the world is expanding. Right. And I do think that there's a, a place for everybody who has something important to say in a way that wants to be heard. And what I know about the people who are in my field who do psychology and television is that they each do something slightly differently. They, they have a slightly different slant that adds to the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so that there really is room for everybody out there who's willing to strive and develop what it is they want to say in a way that people want to hear. And especially now, there are so many platforms. And I am sure you can understand this just even from the framework of podcasts, right? right? It used to be we had a limited amount of radio stations and you know you had to wait for somebody to choose you. Now we really have more of a democratic process going on where if you can create your own content, technology is allowing people to do that. And if people are drawn to you, then you can be part of the playing field. That's the cool part I like. So it, literally this morning, my kids were watching YouTube and they're really, uh, really enthralled with these videos where there's like marble races or they do these hot wheel car races and they're basic. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like super. And my, and my mother-in-law was saying, uh, can, can she was looking at it and she looks, she's can anyone, can anyone do these? I said, yep. 
I said, these, uh-huh. I said, these kids can go upstairs right now and film this and put it on YouTube. And then she goes, but how do they get paid if they do that? I was like, well, pretty interesting. <laughs> and I just started to explain. I was like, yeah, you can put that video up. And there's a tab that sets on YouTube that asks if you want to accept advertising or whatever. And, you know, if right. it gets enough right. views, if it gets mm-hmm. enough views, you know, the advertisers will, you know, they'll, they'll slap it on there as an ad, especially exactly. if, if it's up there. So it's pretty interesting how you say it how you how you talk about that and that was just what we were talking about earlier and with billions and billions and billions of people getting more access to the world via social internet phones computers tablets xyz there's bound to be someone right and i mean like someone as in several thousand people who Mm -hmm. who will gravitate towards your message, whatever that is. I mean, it's just the numbers, right? Mathematically, it's, it's got, it's gotta yeah. be. Yeah. So, you know, I, there's a lot of noise out there, right? So for sure. For sure. Case. And, but I do think that, um, it's really interesting. Just on an aside, I was having this conversation over LinkedIn with, this doctor who I feel like I've met in person, she, she does occasional TV, not, not so much, but she's a pediatrician who's in the TV world. And she was taking issue with something a celebrity was saying about some medical issue. I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. And I kind of weighed in and I said, you know, this particular actor doesn't even have a college degree let alone a medical degree. Oh, wow. And, that I take, and I take issue with celebrities using their platform for medical issues that they really are undereducated on and a little information can be dangerous with a lot of people hanging on to what they say. And so the doctor wrote back and she goes, listen, there are a lot of intelligent people without college degrees. And I said, yes, that is not my point. My point was not to be intellectually imperious in any way, shape or form, but to just really be aware of, you know, who's saying what and where it's coming from, what the Mm -hmm. source is before you take on information as being true. And she was saying one of the struggles she has in the medical profession is that somebody who's a researcher will put information out there that's well-documented, well-researched, and then some blogger will put something out that is based on very little information and both seems to have equal weight. So the onus now, because there's so much information out there, really is to be more discriminating about how we process this information and what we accept as true versus uh, very light in terms of proving anything at all. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. I, I, um, I see that. And there is, there is a lot of noise out there, but what I, I think the pendulum is swinging the other way in that Mm -hmm. we've, we've, we've become accustomed to the noise. I don't say accustomed to it, but we, we recognize it's out there. I, I, at least that's how I'm seeing it. And I think people are starting to learn, uh, in mass how to sift, or at least that they should sift through some of it and that not all of it is the same. Mm -hmm. So, but it is scary too because there, there's it, like with any industry, any I mean, there's like snake oil salesmen that used to travel from town to town. I mean, it's still the same thing, right? Like whether it's um, whether it's online, whether it's um, you know any kind of business, there's still your certain set of kind of I don't want to call them charlatans, but but people who will get over um, and not be very deep and and just only be surface or only be about the sale. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the, for me personally, that's, that's where I, you know, I, I pull my guns out and, and come out swinging. <laughs> right. yeah. Not, no, not that no, I'm like I, a fighter or anything, but that's no, where but I, 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 hear, really I hear beg you. people to, to uh, I did a post, I did a post a couple weeks ago where it was just like, oh, so what happened was I wrote, I wrote a book. And in that book, there's this. Congratulations! Oh, thank you. There's uh, I did I did it with with a colleague of mine, Dr. Rob Irwin, and and he uses this thing called the belief matrix, which helps people get at their negative belief. And then he sent me a text of a photo of somebody who went through one of his seminars, 
who, you know, has rebranded himself because everyone's a brand. And he right. had the exact belief matrix on his website. Oh. So check this out. So that belief matrix was published in my book, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Rob contributed to the book and his name's on the front of it. But, right. that, but that he had published that belief matrix in another book called The Power of Coaching. Like, I wasn't even licensed yet. I haven't even finished school yet. And so I literally, like, went to this guy's office space and check it out. There wasn't even an office space. It was a postal annex. And, ah. and he was making it seem like, you know, we're at this address, office suite numbers, you know, 100 yeah. through 135. And it's like, uh, you mean, you mean box number 135? Anyways, and I, I left a message and just was, you know, hey, Dr. Jason Richardson here, have a question about your belief program. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I just, uh, it just gets to me because- I, I know, and uh, I, I mean, a good <laughs> thing in terms of um, our kids is that, you know, when I was young, I think, I don't even know if I was taught to even question what was written or published. Yeah. I don't know that I was trained to think that way until later in my career. Yeah. And I know that my kids- now, because we've trained them to almost always ask, what's the source? So even when I say something, they'll say, what's the source? That yes. means it's that accurate. Yes, yes. Like, well, leave me, my, my source is accurate. Right. But at least it trains them to understand that different publications, some way, some may be more credible than others. And, um, you know, to not give everything the same weight. And just because something is published in words, it doesn't mean that it can't be questioned or shouldn't be questioned. Yeah. Researched or not, right? Re researched or not. Yeah. Because there are very intelligent people that are well licensed and well credentialed and may have ideas that are not accurate or skewed or whatever the case may be. And so I think it's just always a really good habit to get into to say who's saying it, where are they coming from? And millennials now, since they have access to the internet and, and so much research, they really can do this for themselves. Nice, nice. So let's shift gears a bit because you were a journalist, correct? Well, actually, or wait, the truth- I'm, Or a broadcaster. I, I, I no 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 I I I was um but my career was really I started on the therapy track first. Oh, okay. So that was really my my first track and um while I was doing my TV so at the beginning of my TV career I did not have my doctorate. That was something that I was kind of I was multitasking and achieving as as I went along. Uh -huh. So I kind of always was getting advanced education it may it may have been through an institute where i was just honing my clinical skills but my first job really was in the therapy realm and that's i was i was doing an interview recently and i realized oh my god my goals kind of happened in the same way Way that I had them. So my first goal was to be a therapist. And then I wanted to do therapy TV. And then I wanted to write a book. And that's kind of the, the direction that I chose. So I was a therapist first, and I really didn't even know how to get into TV. I, I knew I wanted to do it. I thought I would do it, but I was not really sure how to go about doing it. And, and again, I look at the colleges today, and there are so many TV studios, which is so exciting. Isn't it? Yeah, which did not exist when as much when I went to school, at least where I was. So I majored in communications in undergrad and thought that was the direction I would go in. But I didn't have an avenue because there's no one way of getting into television. It's highly variable and it's so competitive. It's not like people will necessarily say, well, this is how I did it. Mm -hmm. Although I do, I do offer a service where I will do a consultation with somebody and I will help them figure out how to get into the TV world. That's awesome. With honest information that they can bank on and even make referrals of people who can help them. So I do offer that service because I know it's a frustration. And I never had it, but I, um, once I was a therapist, I went for special training on, on how to get into TV because I wasn't sure how to do that. And mm -hmm. by way of that, I found a, a, basically a TV coach. And we, we put together, she gave me TV training on how to anchor and how to put together a TV package. And she helped a lot of people get into the TV world. And I had this 
tape that I put together. I wrote and put together and figured out how to put together TV packages and put it on a demo reel with this man who kind of showed up at one point in my life and then kind of disappeared. He um, kind of would get people into the TV world, would send out a bunch of reels, which news directors would look at, and people would get hired. And I basically asked him to be my agent because I had a theory that male voices were respected and listened to a lot more than female voices. And uh, he kind of operated as my semi-agent kind of, um, I guess, demo pusher. And it was through that that I got a job in Elmira, New York, working as a psychology reporter and then had my own segment called Real Talk. But they originally wanted to hire me as a, an anchor, a morning anchor. And the news director said, we really need a morning anchor. We'd love you to be the morning anchor. And I said, you know, I live in New York City. I still see patients. I, I don't know that I can relocate in upstate New York, but let me pitch you an alternative idea. I'd love to be a psychology reporter and report on all things psychological in the news. And he hired me on the spot. And I was on the news that night talking about Timothy McVeigh. No, awesome. So it was, yeah. And so, um, and it's funny because the news director, who was the news director at that time, I mean, we since are, are really good friends. We're like family um, at this point. But so I was kind of weaving in the TV while I was doing the therapy. And because I lived in New York, I really tried to get a local TV job. And I was told, listen, you know, New York City's the number one market. And this news director kind of met with me and she said, I could hire you, but I wouldn't be doing you any favors because New York does not accept people making mistakes. And you need to go to a place that you can make mistakes and they'll love you and they won't hold it against you. And she was right. She was really, really right. Because when I was in upstate New York, they embraced me as one of their own. And mm -hmm. of course I made mistakes, but you know, they're used to mistakes in that market and that didn't interfere with them connecting to me and what I had to say. And then there was really no place for me in the local market in New York City. There was more of a national platform right. because they really wanted the psychological input on various stories. So really that's how I gained a national platform. My original goal was to be a local, you know, psychology reporter and, and just be in New York city. And that was kind of my goal. And, and then maybe write a book or two, mm -hmm. but because the local market didn't really have an interest in that, um, as I kind of envisioned it, it was the national market that kind of embraced me. Wow. That's brilliant. So I have this thing because someone asked, I was on a podcast and someone asked me, um, you know, what, what's one thing you would do different? And I said, you know what, I would, I would have started all of this sooner. I wouldn't have waited till I was Dr. J. Rich. I would have just started because, because mm -hmm. I had, because I had a platform as an athlete who had traveled the world and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, whether yeah, it's speaking, yeah. um, and, you know, hindsight, whatever. But, but what I like about your story is that you did that. You started, mm -hmm. you, you, like I, I say, start yesterday. So you literally started yesterday. So you didn't necessarily wait. I mean, you, no. you grew up within your career, right? Like you yeah. literally said, okay, I'm doing this and I want to do this and, and I'm going to work this concurrently and together. And, and, and it sounds like you did it in a very ethical and professional way, right? Like you still stayed in your lane, which is like to be applauded because a lot of times, you know, it's easy when, when TV and the lights come on, it's really easy to kind of, you know, throw some of those uh, morals and values out the window and just say yes, even though, <laughs> but it sounds like you're, you were really stuck to your values and your character um, as you went along that path. So that's huge. I mean, listen, I, I, I really do my philosophy in life is really to say yes and to see where that leads me. But I, I, I was seeing patients at, at the time I did have a master's. Mm -hmm. I was, my background is from, you know, I come from working at a psychiatric hospital. So I had worked with the more severe disorders and really psychology is what always really 
interest me yeah. and getting those ideas across and just seeing the changes that have happened over really kind of not a long time, but the time that I've been in the media business is really fascinating. I mean, there have been so many changes, but at, when I was taking this course on how to get into TV. I'll never forget. And they had, it wasn't just in front of the camera. This was a course for, for any aspect of television. So if you were interested in being a producer, if you were interested in getting into sound, if you were interested in getting into any aspect of television, this course was speaking to it and had relationships with experts in the field. And they would come in and speak to the class. Mm -hmm. And there was this one lovely teacher. I think he was He might have been in radio, but I I forget exactly what field he was in, in the media business. But he said something so powerful and it resonated is really true for me. He said, listen, don't wait until you feel good enough or, you you know, you get enough under your belt. He's like, just do, Mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And through doing, you learn. And that's just such a powerful truth. It's through the doing that you hone your skill. As long as, as you say, you're doing it in a responsible way. You're being transparent about who you are and what you do and, you know, where your expertise lie and where they don't. I was just asked the other day to talk about hypnosis and why it works. And I said, I can't speak to that. I don't do hypnosis. I don't know anyone who does. And so I don't really feel comfortable speaking about that because it's it's not what I do. Mm -hmm. So there's enough to speak about where you really can offer something meaningful to the conversation. And I just, you know, as long as you are doing that, then I think it's okay. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So on that, the spirit of that, I think you can speak about some of these next questions I have, and I I didn't ex- plan for this show to go this way, but um, since you're on the news and you've you've been talking, you're I'm sure you're well aware of everything that's going on uh, as far yeah. as yeah everything because I mean how can we not be if we're stripping because that's uh, my thing is I'm really trying to just strip it down to fundamental human behavior without the label. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I take a lot of heat for that (laughs) because I, because I think people look at me and think I should take a certain side or be a certain way. Don't get me wrong. I do have a side. I just don't always Mm -hmm. throw that out there on Facebook. Um, I I get it. I get um, it. But what, what's going on out here? Like, like in the, we'll keep it to the United States, but what is going on? Like what, what is your vibe? What's your What's your psychologist spidey sense telling you? I'm so curious to know because it's a um we're in an interesting Are you time. talking about are you talking so, about politics? Yeah, so we have but but see all of it's melding together, right? All of it's become, yeah. all of it's become convoluted, right? So sports is political. Uh politics is political. Uh <laughs> politics is racial. Sports is racial. Race is politics. Right. So it's all, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's so funny. I mean, in a way, I see it as, as uh, cyclical, uh-huh. and um, that you know, there's a pendulum swinging. So, um, trying to be as apolitical as possible, you know, there was Barack Obama, who was you know the president for eight years, and he had a very distinct style. Yep, and. It worked for some people and not others. And, you know, I've spoken to some people in the black community have felt like it was great to have a finally a black man in office. And but yet they wanted him to do more, you know, Mm -hmm. and here he had to play to everybody. And, you know, he had more of this peacemaking kind of approach and it was very different. Right. It was a very different approach of Mm -hmm. not kind of. Um, presenting this, you know, the United States is the big brother, the big powerful brother. I mean, he was kind of approaching things in a very distinctly different way. Mm -hmm. And while it worked for for many people, I think there were many people that felt stifled by that. And so then here comes Donald Trump, who is the exact opposite of the pendulum. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, so then all the people who were kind of sitting there stewing in silence or whatever, 
then voted for a very different kind of president who would present in a very different kind of way. Mm -hmm. And then it's producing a a different set of feelings and uh, anger, right? Right. So I see it as like two extremes and probably the next president will be something in the middle. Because yeah, that, but we'll, I, <laughs> right. Something and and then they'll be and then people will be mad because they're not extreme enough, right? So right. well, probably. And I think that you know one of the things I really wonder about politics is if they're just off the mark completely. You know, do we need kind of a, a more of a pragmatic party to kind of navigate through? the the challenges of of both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party because there are many people that really feel more independent they mm-hmm. a- ascribe to certain aspects of the Republican Party and not others and the same is true on the Democratic side yeah. but I think this level of anger that mm-hmm. is bubbling over is creating a lot of anxiety. Yeah, yeah. And it's disrupting a lot of relationships because there was research done that found that people could more easily talk about race and gender and identity issues than than what political side of the fence they were on. Yep. So, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. No, go ahead. No, no so I was just going to say, I was just going to finish it off by saying that, you know, we have to get out of this desire to talk in an echo chamber mm-hmm. where we're just hearing our own ideas being fed back to us. Confirmation because bias. That, yeah, because that is very dangerous. Um, it's a very dangerous mindset and it doesn't help us to advance to where we need to be. And so that's true also across the board. We live near people who kind of think more or less like us, who are more or less in our situation. And I think we need to get better at hearing really very diverse ideas and figuring out what to do with them all. I, I couldn't agree more. And the funny thing about this, like, cause I was, I think about this stuff all the time. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in my next book. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But um, it's, I, I don't, I think fundamentally most humans barring, you know, severe psychopathology generally want the same things and yeah. like basic same things. And, and you've right. seen it, you've seen millionaires with just as much pain as people in poverty. You've seen, um, and you've seen the same right. pathology, regardless of race, gender, mm-hmm. um, or 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 so, socioeconomic status. So, mm-hmm. right, stripping it away. But I was I was thinking about uh, my my cousins and my parents and and my in laws and and his in laws, and and we were talking. She's like, oh my gosh, they're so you know he you know my dad is incorrigible. He's a you know, he's a Trump, he's so pro Trump, so pro Trump. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about when they were, when those, you know, that group of parents was at my house visiting, how Mm -hmm. well they got along with my in-laws who are not Mm -hmm. pro Trump. And I was thinking, well, wait, you know, they probably have more, right. So I'm sure if they had a political conversation, they'd be, you know, throwing stones at each other. Right. But at the end of the day, what they're like practicing in their own lives, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, working hard, being nice to other people, doing the best that you can for your kids, you know, putting money in the bank for later, like just basic, excuse me, bump the microphone, get so excited in here. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But just basic fundamental, you know, things to do. Now, will they agree on every little tit and tat? No. But for the most part, um, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think, Republicans want to see young people or, you know, kids starve or be hurt. I really don't like, right, it's right. just, it's just not tenable. Like, it's just really like, and, you, and also you, there's and a, vice there's, versa. And there's a problem with Congress. I mean, <laughs> that nothing can get passed. Right. It's a problem. Like, hello, we really need you guys to work together for the greater good. Yes. Otherwise it's like nothing's getting passed and everything's getting reversed. So there's a problem within the system that's not working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something needs to be restructured. And listen, that's out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, same. Same. Otherwise we can be the ticket, right? Yeah. (laughs) And you know what? To really play it politically correct, 
You can uh -huh. you you know the we'll have the woman as president and then we'll have the black vice president, right? And there then, you like go. you could be right. We could we could just like tick all the boxes on like all the exactly. socially perfectly correct marketable polarizing so <laughs> things again. So but it's it, right. We can hit that algorithm perfectly. But yeah, yeah. But back to the original uh, conversation. Yeah, I think I think in general, you know, not not all liberals are retarded. Um, right. And, and not all Republicans are mean and out for, you know, money. Like it's just neither situation is tenable. Like it's like because when I walk around the world and I observe people, especially in our country. Um, yeah. yeah, we people people hurt. Yes. But people also rejoice and people also celebrate. And it's just like I want to get through my day and be happy about the day. Like there was an there was an interesting there was another study done about kind of the, the Republican brain and and the Democratic brain and um, understanding how to take goal you know ideas that both sides of the fence really feel passionate about how to create kind of these how to address these goals from each perspective to make each side of the fence kind of work together and collaborate. So wow. like the Republicans um, really do want God's earth to be plentiful and, and, and thriving. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the Democrats want that too. They tend to focus on the science and, and global warming. So if we can somehow look at the common goals and work from there, like, right. Hey, okay. We both have this common goal. How do we get there? that it might start a more healing process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting idea. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a bigger question because I, okay. I'm going to pretend you know it all. Um, okay. I, I believe you know more than me though. So, so <laughs> well, because it's a big right, leap. It's a, it's a big leap of faith. It's all right. Well, I'm, I'm used to that. So we, who's in control? I mean, really, because, because they're, because if you look at every any entity, and I understand groupthink, and I understand herd mentality, and all that stuff, but but who's in control? Because if because when you get even in the upper echelons of anything, there's still individuals in there yeah. doing it with their own lives. So and, and you know we and we tend to talk about things and people and groups as these monoliths, right? The media, right. the Republicans, the Democrats. We do it, even mm -hmm. even even you and I, and, and and we don't mean any malice by it, but just. Just right. In general. Well, you have to categorize right exactly in some way. To, well, to, just like it's like a speed reading, right? You have right. to. Right. Well, that's what the brain does. That, quickly. Yeah, yeah, the brain's just looking for a way to make sense of the world. So, right. who's in control? I mean, in in a larger sense, because I I feel like my spidey sense is like, it, it's almost like we're stuck as uh -huh. a as a as a people in this yeah. rut of like polarization because that's mm -hmm. kind of keeping. That's keeping this status quo, mm -hmm. uh -huh. you know. So, like, if you if you don't if you pick a side, then that means I got your vote, or I have that dollar bill, or I have that you know whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So I guess you know. So you have the media, you have the the rich people, you have the <laughs> the social justice people, you have just all these groups. But who is in control of it? And then, you know, conspiracy theories. So in your opinion, or is it just more of part of human evolution? And we've seen this before, just 200 years ago, you know, Roman, yeah. or I shouldn't say 200 years ago, it's such hundreds a, it's of years such, ago. It's such a challenging question. I mean, I mean, ultimately, I think we are all in, individually in control of of ourselves of course and, um, and when i think about it i think about how how many people walk around in a zone looking at their phone mm -hmm. and then what what they're looking at i you know to be a little bit jaded i want to say follow the money mm. follow the money yeah i would agree with that and and find out who are these big people that are creating whatever it is that trickles down that influences people. Right. And then there's this additional piece of human nature where there, there was this letter between Einstein and Freud and Einstein must've felt a little guilty creating the nuclear bomb. Right. So he must've felt a little bit 
guilty for that because he was like a man of peace. Right. And he asked Freud, who was kind of a depressed guy. I mean, listen, he lived in Europe as a Jew with a lot to, with a lot of anti-Semitism, and he was kind of considered an outsider originally in his in his field of, of medicine. But um, I guess. I guess uh, Einstein said, hey, is there any hope for human nature for us to be able to, you know, get along and live together and be peaceful? And Freud's like, no. Uh, basically <laughs> that, you, know, uh, you gotta love Freud, right? Like <laughs> You gotta love him. You gotta love his like depressed bluntness. Right. But basically what, what he was saying, and I do agree with this, is that there is a tremendous human need to hate or to feel aggressive towards another person. And that is part of who we are. And I don't know if that's going to change so quickly. So, you know, evolution doesn't work that fast. Yeah. Having, and so I think that's another aspect that's going on here, the us, them. And until we think from more of a we mentality, yes, uh, we're going to stay stuck. But there is this desire to hate another, that there's mm. something cathartic or... Um, uh, liberating about that. Well, it's safe too. Defined. It's a sa yeah. to me. It's a safe way to feel important. Um, right. And when you have that, um, and I'm just going to call it that visceral kind of thing going on. Uh, yeah. It. It. You know. It, we. We know what happens in the brain, and it's just like all kinds of dopamine. Boom. 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 <laughs> And, and, and there's a feeling there and, and I know yes. a, a secondary feeling, right? Secondary yeah. gain. So, so, and it's easy, right? Cause it's easy to be angry. It's, it's more difficult to be sad, right? Cause when you're angry, right. you're upset because something didn't go the way you expected or the way you wanted it to ultimately, mm -hmm. right? We tantrum humans, adults tantrum too. Right. So, but it's, but it's also a way of, it's a safe way to feel important. And, right. and align and feel empowered, even though it's not always exactly right. productive. Exactly right. I mean, I you're preaching to the choir. So it's a lot more fun to feel angry and powerful than in pain and weak. Mm -hmm. And it's a and, way to feel alive. It's a way to feel and, alive. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I talk a lot about murder, right? And uh, people are interested in it because it's vicariously thrilling you know, to hear people kind of giving into their primal urges. But the goal for any successful society is to figure out, you know, how to stop getting in our own way. How not know? to murder. <laughs> how, how not to give into our primal urges. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Because can, you that's tell a... I live in, can you tell I live in New York City? Yeah, I love how it. How not I to give it. into your primal urges of murder. Uh, I love it. That's like so, <laughs> like, I was when you said that, I'm like, I don't think anyone's ever mentioned murder on the gold medal mindset before. <laughs> the, You're welcome. Hey, You're welcome. The, no. So, and you know what? With Halloween coming up, the gold murder mindset. There we go. Done. Yeah. Done. There you go. Um, no, I, I hear you. And it's, it's, it's so funny because I think, you know, you talked about walking around on the phones, um, just glued to the phones. That's, that's the other piece. We're kind of, we and I say we like myself included, right? Because I'm not like yeah. you know Mr. Goody Two Shoes and I can and I have perfect boundaries about my phone. We are very much, in a way, constantly looking in on other, mm -hmm. you know. And I I developed a habit when I was younger, when I was uh, racing bikes, um, competitively, to stop looking at magazines. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it sounds weird because I, but I, I was choosing to read and I was choosing mm -hmm. to just engage differently. Um, mm -hmm. But I felt like a lot of the magazines, even though they were interesting, and I was young, so you know, my twenties, so GQ, not GQ, what was that one? Maxim was a magazine that was popular. Mm -hmm. uh, I was into cars, so I liked, I loved the car magazines and stuff like that. But I also noticed that when I read those magazines, I was feeling like I wasn't doing enough. I mm -hmm. needed, I needed more that my life right. was somehow lacking. And I'm not saying that they weren't well written or beautifully photographed or any of that stuff, but I felt like wait, like I don't like this. Yeah. Right? So it's I'm, like we used to call we used to call like Vogue and magazines like that kind of like fashion porn. It just like creates this desire. Yeah. Which I guess it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? And not only that, 
not only that for me because i am competitive and i was kind of like wait i can like choose to peer in on this magazine and wish uh-huh. and wish i had x or wish i was yeah. living an x life yeah or i could actually go out and do it yeah like do i need to always see the picture of the lamborghini to go out and buy it right like I'm pretty right. sure I have that vision in my head. Okay, got it. Yeah. Snapshot done. But <laughs> but I can actually go out in the world and create the life I want versus, you know, watching everyone else do it. And that's yeah. that was a personal choice for me. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I I'm gonna thank God that that just kind of came to me naturally. But mm-hmm. I think what's happening with the phones um, is we we do that, and and because there's such a I mean, geez, I mean, a magazine's at least elective, right? You can choose what you right. want to see. But sometimes with the phone, even on your feed, and I've been playing with Facebook a little bit, like deleting certain things, and I've noticed that it pops up more. Because you know what? I'm guessing the algorithm is saying you're engaging with it versus just scrolling past it. You see what I'm saying? Oh, uh, I don't. Yeah, that could be. I, I'm yeah, so, sure. so I'm really playing with all of this because it's part of my research for my book. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, that it's we're we're kind of fed a lot of, inf- I don't want to say information, a lot of stuff. And, and I think if we can, what's, go ahead. What's interesting in terms of the, the Facebook too, and then I'm going to have to hop off. Yeah, no problem. CNN, but, um, what's interesting is that they're finding that Facebook now, and this is why it may be another really, really useful platform like Netflix mm-hmm. is better able because of all the, inf- think of all the information and we choose to share with Facebook. We Correct. want to share with Facebook, right. right? They have better ways of targeting advertising than TV. Yeah, they do. They, they do because they can target with more specific algorithms than television can. And so if you follow the money, right, mm-hmm. then businesses are going to go wherever they can target people uh, to buy and shop and get all those things. Right. So real quick before you go on to CNN, and I thank you so much because I know you're super busy and you got to run, be on CNN. Well, we'll stay in touch. Yes, yes. yes. But if you can answer this real quick, what's one thing you wish everyone knew? That feelings are not facts. Ah, I love it. (laughs) Chapter six. (laughs) And to follow the plan. Nice, nice. Feelings are not facts. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you, Dr. Robbie. Um, Thank you. It yeah, was a that pleasure was awesome. meeting you. And I have a sneaking suspicion our paths will cross in person soon so. enough. Yeah. I hope so. And you have a great day. Thank yeah. you for including me in this conversation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks okay, for taking bye-bye. the time to mine for gold on the Gold Medal Mindset Podcast. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter at Real Dr. J. Rich or on the web at drjasonrichardson.com. That's drjasonrichardson.com. Take care and have a great day.